Hey everyone, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, May 27th, 2016. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and we got some really cool stories for you today. We're going to be talking about, as he looks down at his laptop, uh, fresh lunar craters, early universe detected, uh, update on Juno, uh, Europa's oceans having Earth-like chemical balance, primordial black holes, uh, an Indian satellite launch, uh, and a huge asteroid smashing into Australia and images from Meerkat. Joining us this week, we've got, actually you can now see this tiny little grid of people, but in case you're not able to make them out, we've got Kimberly Cartier. Hey, Kimberly. Hi, Frazier. Hello, viewers. We got Jolene Creighton. Hi, Frazier and Kimberly and viewers. We got Nicole Gallucci. Everything is different. Everything is different, I know, but you know that's how it works. If you're going to do you shows with me, then everything's going to be different all the time. Uh, we've, got, we've got Paul, Matt, Sutter. I'll just say hi. Be chill. <laughs> and we got Brian Koberlein, who also has never been in the new regime. No, I haven't. I've been gone for months and months. So, so welcome to the new world. Thank order. you. Um, this is, uh, yeah, we're using Wirecast now instead of using the Google Hangouts on air. Much love to Google, but it was just sort of getting too complicated to handle. And we've got a special guest, and I'm once again super excited. We've got uh, Seth Shostak from, Come in Earth. <laughs> from the SETI Institute and other places. Seth, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Terrific. Uh, so for like anyone who has no idea who Seth Shostak is, can you please give us your, the an intro about who you are and what you do? Well, <laughs> I'm an astronomer here at the SETI Institute in lovely, glamorous Mountain View, California. That's in the heart of the Silicon Valley. And uh, we're looking for life in space here. I mean, that's the job of the people whose offices surround my office. And most of them are looking for life nearby, but we're looking for intelligent life, which might not be so nearby. So we're trying to do what Jodie Foster did in the movie, contact if anybody remembers that of course of course i mean you are really the poster child for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence you're well, the I person suppose that's a compliment i don't be a... <laughs> you are the person who is uh taking those those headphones you're you're walking out to the big radio telescopes you're plugging it directly in and you're listening for that uh for that alien music yeah it doesn't um, work quite that way but, yes. okay well then why don't you tell me how it does work? that's right <laughs> because that was that was I'm sure that's how I had it in my mind. Yeah. Well, in the movies, in the movies. So how yeah. does it work? Well, in fact, all the data are recorded automatically and you just have to log in. You don't have to go anywhere near the antennas, which is maybe a good thing because they're 350 miles from where I'm sitting here. So that's a long drive. And besides, we're monitoring, what, 40 million channels simultaneously. So that would be 20 million pairs of earphones. And, you know, that would be uncomfortable. Um, so if I recall my radio telescope uh, science, the problem with radio telescopes is they don't really do like a big wide field of view. They're really focused on very small chunks of the sky, very, you know, almost individual pixels. I know like Arecibo can only have a resolution of a couple of pixels at a time. And so you really have to focus on these individual stars and be able to, you know, track and listen for the signal. So how much of the sky right now is being actively surveyed for signals from, from other worlds? Well, we do tend to focus in, uh, not so much because the telescope couldn't see a wider field of view. The Allen Telescope Array, which is the antenna we use, actually can look at quite a bit of the sky. We can look at you know, three, four degrees across. That's a big chunk of sky and much, much larger than you would get with most optical telescopes, in fact. But what we do is we actually make radio pixels on the sky. So we, you know, and the pixels we make are, are quite small. They're you know, maybe a couple of percent of the apparent area of the full moon. So, yeah, we do that, and we have three such pixels on the sky at once in different places, so that if we find a signal coming from one star system, we can look at the two other star systems that we're pointing at simultaneously and decide, hey, look, do we see the signal there too? Because if you do, then it's just man-made interference. And if you don't, maybe you call the, uh, call the newspapers. Right, or you, like, circle your piece of paper and write the words wow on it. Well, yes, but that was, that was in 1977 when they didn't have, uh, you know, much in the way of computer displays. So what is the state then of, of City right now? I mean, you know, we've, whenever we do like articles about the history, you can sort of see when the techniques were first developed. Sort of where are we now along that spectrum? How sort of how advanced and how sort of how much of an industry is this right now? Are you guys, or are you guys just the, the holding the only candle? 
No, 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 we're not. We're not. There's a, there's a group at Berkeley and they just got a big chunk of money from a Russian billionaire. So they're, they're doing their thing. But indeed, the total number of people in the world that are doing SETI is, you know, comparable to the number of people who are actually guests on this broadcast, if you will. So it, it's, a, it's a very small group. But what has changed, aside from the astronomy, I mean, that, that in some ways is maybe the most important thing. We've, we've learned that planets are common and maybe one in five stars has a planet sort of like the Earth. I mean, that's something we didn't know even five years ago. But in terms of our search, what's really changed is the technology. I don't think many people recognize the fact that our search kind of speeds up by about a factor of two every couple of years. So whatever you did, you know, this last year is probably comparable to everything you did in all the years previous. And so that speeding up makes me optimistic that something will something will happen within our lifetimes. And so what precisely are you looking for? Well, we look for what's called a narrow band signal. So that's a signal that's not all over the radio dial. It's at one spot on the radio dial, just like, you know, your local top 40 station, right? It's at one spot on the dial, you know, 810 kilohertz on your dial, whatever it is. All the transmitters make signals that tend to be at one spot on the dial. So we look for that. We're not looking for, you know, messages or anything like that. That's much, much, much more difficult. This way we can just tell, do they have a transmitter? If they have a transmitter, I mean, then probably we can get the money to go back and see if there's, if there's, if there's a message, you know, uh, face certain doom earthlings or whatever it is that they're, they're saying. Um, so, okay, so you've got sort of the, you're, you're looking for the signal from extraterrestrial civilization. Now the, you know, I know one of the sort of standard devil's advocate type questions is like, how do we know the aliens are still going to use archaic radio transmissions? Uh, how do you sort of answer that? Well, to begin with, I, I'm not quite sure why they call radio archaic. It just, it's a technology that was developed a hundred years ago. But we use radio waves for all sorts of things now, much more than we did 100 years ago, right? I mean, television is, in fact, radio, but you're encoding visual information. Uh, you know, your Wi-Fi, that's radio, right? The radar down at the local airport is radio. And, in fact, you could even say that flashing lights are radio just at a higher frequency. So, you know, depending on what physics we might not know, and, of course, nobody knows what we don't know, uh, I think radio will forever be useful to any society. But it's one of those things that you're going to, you know, we as a as an advanced civilization will think kindly on the perhaps the more, you know, the the ones that are behind us and be able to offer these will be backwards compatible with our technology to, to them, even though, you know, they in the future may be communicating in neutrinos, at least they're going to you know, dumb it down for us so we can receive their signals if they really well, want to reach I out. Mean, n n now you're now <laughs> you're kind of speculating on what the aliens might find interesting to do. And we don't have any data on that. So who knows what they're interested in doing? And maybe they can, you know, maybe they converse with neutrinos. A lot of people suggest that to me in emails every week, actually. Yeah, I'm sure the, problem with the, you know, the problem with neutrinos is they're very expensive to make because they have a lot of energy, each neutrino. Okay, so that, that makes them uh, somewhat less attractive than... Um, radio to begin with it's also hard to make them i mean you, you can make them if you're a big star but you know if you want to do it on a tabletop yeah be harder the other thing is detecting neutrinos is very hard the university of wisconsin has a neutrino detector detector down in antarctica and it consists of a kilometer cube of ice right and even so they only can you know detect one neutrino in millions so um, it doesn't sound like a particularly effective way to communicate to me but who knows so how do you you know I know right now you have, you know, ha have you gotten any signals that make you feel like, like there's something else out there? Or is it still mostly just static from the universe? Well, there's no halfway here. Until you've succeeded, you've not succeeded, right? That, that's all you can say, right? It's no, oh, well, that was a half good one, right? Or, or are we close or something? That's, you know, that's like asking... I don't know, like asking uh, Columbus, you know, have you discovered a new continent? And until he actually sails pretty close to the new continent, he doesn't know. <laughs> and you can say, well, but are you close? I mean, he doesn't know. So that's kind of the situation with SETI. It's a one-bit experiment. Right. It's, 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 it's a one or a zero. But, uh, you know, I've heard that people are fairly bullish about being able to actually turn up a signal within a certain period of time, within the next few decades. I mean, do you feel like... Like you've got the right equipment in, like it's, like it's almost like if it's there, if it's happening, and if you scan enough of the sky, will you be able to find it? 
Well, I think so. I mean, obviously, I think so. Otherwise, I wouldn't keep this job, right? So, and I bet everybody a cup of Starbucks will find them within a, two decades, right? Everybody? That's, that's a right. That, yes. That's a guess. Of course it is. And, uh, you know, I may have to buy a lot of coffee. But it, it's, it's simply predicated on the improvement of the equipment and how fast you're looking for that needle in the haystack, right? And over the course of the next two decades, assuming there's funding, and that's a big assumption, but assuming there's funding, we'll be able to check out on the order of a million star systems. And to me, and it's, that's merely intuition, it's not science, but to me, a million star systems sounds like a big enough number that you might trip across a signal. What are the limits of, of being able to detect these signals? How far out into space do you figure you can, you can reach until, you know, the signal's going to be too faint? Well, I mean, that depends entirely on what the aliens are doing, right? If they make a powerful enough transmitter or just maybe not such a powerful transmitter, but a big antenna farm and aim signals in our direction, and I'm not quite sure why they would do that, by the way, but let's say they did, then you could hear them from anywhere. I mean, the, the signals never die out entirely. We pick up we pick up uh, radio noise from the Big Bang, right? The so-called three-degree cosmic background radiation. Well, that's coming from uh, 13 billion light years away. It's still strong enough to be picked up by a radio antenna. So there's no limit, but it depends on how strong their signal is, and that depends on their budget for transmitting. Now, as my good friend, uh, Dr. Nicole Gallucci, who happens to be here in this hangout today, has, has sort of made me aware of, there's this idea that the Earth has been transmitting our location in the universe for 500 million years, really with the, you know, as the oxygen started to build up in the atmosphere and we started to get these chemicals that could only be uh, provided or only be created by some kind of unbalanced chemical situation going on, that any of those advanced civilizations you would think have gotten to a place where they've built up the telescopes, they've built up the arrays that they can actually, they know there's life here and they've watched us, depending on how far away they are, they've seen us move through various ages of, you know, of amounts of oxygen, maybe even seen the pollution in our atmosphere. They know we're here. So, you know, does it seem most likely to you that they, they know we're here and they're, they've been directing these transmitters waiting for us to finally pick up the phone? Well, personally, I don't think they do know we're here. It, she's absolutely right. You know, the, the signature of oxygen in the atmosphere, that's a two billion year old signal, right? Because, you know, we, we got a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere beginning about two billion years ago. Uh, what that indicated was that there was photosynthesis on Earth mostly by, you know, bacteria, right? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, there, there, there could be just, I don't know how many alien societies that have found that and know that there's photosynthesis on Earth, okay? But just because you know that a planet has photosynthesis, okay, it's got cabbage, Bob. Well, <laughs> do you spend a lot of money, you know, sending <laughs> radio messages to it? I, I mean, for 2 billion years? I mean, I don't know that you do that. It doesn't strike me as terribly reasonable. And as far as the rest indicating that Homo sapiens is here, that information, that's very new. That's since the Second World War, the radar, mainly the radar, but also television, FM radio, that sort of thing. But that's only been leaking out for 70 years, right? So that means anybody more than 35 light years away hasn't had enough time to pick up those signals and respond to us. So I think it's, I think it's a fairly safe bet. Nobody knows we're here. I mean, if we detected, I wonder if we did detect with, say, the James Webb Space Telescope or, you know, the after we get the Terrestrial Planet Finder uh, rebuilt and, and uh, funded, uh, and we actually do find a world with some kind of same situation as, as Earth, will we be listening directly at those planets? Will, you know, will you put a lot of emphasis on those worlds? Well, we do that already. I mean, there have been something like three dozen uh, exoplanets, as they're called, exoplanets that have been found so far that are considered habitable. You know, you could build condos on them. They might have liquid oceans. They might have atmospheres. We don't know if they do, but, you know, they're more or less the same size as Earth, so that means they're kind of rocky worlds, and they're at the right distance from their star to have the kind of salubrious temperatures we enjoy here in California every third day. So it could be... Oh, just rub it in. Yes. So it could be that, you know, I mean, obviously you look at those plants, but do keep in mind, I mean, you, you know, the Klingons could have had a SETI experiment looking at the earth for four and a half billion years and not found any signals. So the fact that you have three dozen other planets in, that you're looking at, that's not a big enough sample to be terribly interesting. So then, I mean, obviously you've dedicated your life to the search for aliens and it is, should it be found? I mean, as you said, it's a binary question but it is possibly the most fundamental and important question that a human being can ask. 
So, you know, I think it's, you know, it's, it's worth doing. Where do you stand then on the Fermi paradox? Where do I stand on the Fermi? On its head. I, I don't know. The Fermi paradox is just this idea that, look, if there are advanced societies out there, they've had billions of years head start on us, many of them, right? The universe is three times as old as the earth. It's been plenty of time for somebody, whatever they want to do, they've had time to do it if they want to do it. And that includes colonizing the entire galaxy. So this was realized between two bites of a tuna fish sandwich by Enrico Fermi back in 1950, apparently. This may all be apocryphal, but it doesn't really matter because the argument is still the same. There's been plenty of time for any you know, ambitious society to colonize the entire galaxy. So we should see aliens everywhere, or at least evidence of aliens everywhere. And we don't. So what does that mean? Where are they? That's the way Fermi uh, actually posed this little conundrum. But to me, it's just, you know, okay, we don't see the aliens, so now we're deciding they're not there. You know, I don't, I don't see any lions outside the, the window here, not in the parking lot down there. Maybe they've got, had to park a couple of blocks away. I don't know. But, you know, that's a local observation, no lions here. So am I justified in, in saying, you know what, there are no lions in the universe, or none on Earth, anyhow, right? I mean, that would be a big conclusion based on a very local observation. So that's kind of the way I feel about the Fermi Paradox. Yeah, it, it gives me a little hope that we're going to be able to survive the singularity and as the computers take over and turn us all into um, computer parts, that maybe there's a chance to, to prevent that from happening because our solar system isn't you know constantly being visited by other alien robotic probes and and them sitting up their monoliths so that you know that's what i feel like there's a little bit of hope there well how do you i i, I, I didn't quite follow you it, it is true that maybe we're inventing our successors i think that i agree with you on that but the fact that we don't see any alien machines here all right. Does that make you feel more confident that we won't invent machines that'll do it? That's us? right. Yeah. Yeah. That'll run rampant through the universe. Well, maybe the machines have no interest in us, but they're out there. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> that, that's kind of sad. What does that say about us? Well, I, listen, interesting I, I, I enough don't, to. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time, you know, visiting the ants in my backyard. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't mean that they're not there. And not, right. I'm not here, but. You yeah, know, exactly. I, I got other things to do, so I don't spend a lot of time with them. Uh, so I would love to know what you would what could you use what would be help the search go better to make a much more you know complete survey of, of everything that's out there to to get closer to that to that binary event you know what i mean the allen array is a wonderful machine but i'm sure it's just the beginning of of what could be a much even more powerful array out there what would what would really help you with the search well, to be very blunt about it, the thing that would help the most is have enough funding to do all the things that you can, you know, that you can easily think of, which are mostly in the realm of improving the equipment, uh, speeding up the search. You know, we could speed it up by probably two orders of magnitude, so a factor of 100 or so, by, uh, by just building different receiver setups than what we have. But, you know, you're talking about a million dollars or a couple of million dollars, depending on what you do. And uh, that's, not, uh, that's not particularly big money in science, but on the other hand, all of the SETI research here is privately funded. So, you know, you have to, you have to raise it from people who find this an interesting thing to do. And it, it, it's, just a, it's just a hard thing to do. So there's that. That's just continuing the search and improving the equipment. That's, to me, the best thing you can probably do right now for SETI. Uh, obviously, there are always advances in astronomy, uh, and, and occasionally, maybe even in physics, that give you new insight into, well, are we doing the right thing or is there some other experiment we should be doing instead of this? Yeah. Um, so I've got some questions from the audience. Uh, one is, um, uh, let's see. So this comes from Anubhav Saha. Uh, how closely is SETI following Tabby's star? And this is, of course, the one with the suspected alien megastructure, which of course we have our local expert, we've debunked many times. Um, you guys have done some observations on this star? We have. Uh, when that was announced, we spent more or less a week actually looking at Tabby Star with the Allen Telescope Array and just sort of stepping up the radio dial to see if we could find any signals uh, using various bandwidths to, to do that. And we didn't find anything. Okay. I mean, if we had found something, that would be really interesting, right? <laughs> but, but we didn't find anything, and that's somewhat less interesting. It could mean that, there, you know, Tabby Star has a perfectly natural explanation. It has nothing to do with alien megastructures. In fact, you know, Tabby's team itself never suggested alien megastructures. But, and, and, and personally, I think that's probably what's going to happen, because it always has in the past. You know, aliens always get the blame for anything new. But 
uh, the, the trouble with Tabby Star is that it's almost 1,500 light years away. That's a long way. And that means that in order for us to be able to hear a radio signal coming from some society there, uh, it would have to be a pretty big transmitter or, you know, very specifically aimed in our direction. And so I don't think you can rule anything out by the fact that we didn't get a signal, but we didn't. Uh, this question comes from Nancy Graziano. What is your view about the hypothesis that we haven't detected a signal yet is because it's being disguised by the cosmic microwave background radiation? Well, I don't know how that would do that. The cosmic microwave background radiation is very broadband. It's, a, it's what's called a thermal spectrum. So it's all over the dial, but it peaks in the millimeter range of uh, radio waves. We don't e even examine the millimeter wave range. So we're in a completely different part of the spectrum, and we're looking for narrow band signals. So they would stick out. Uh, the cosmic background, cosmic background, yeah, it's this background hiss, but there's a background hiss due to the air conditioning or the heating in your office, but you can still hear somebody who comes in and talks to you. Uh, this is, question comes from Kenneth Lepree, which I, I find really interesting. So if you find a signature, do you have the freedom to publish it or do you have to pass it by the government first? You're a private organization, so how would you release evidence of, of, a, of contact? Yes, we would have to pass it by the Bosnia-Herzegovinian government first. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, I can tell you on the basis of... hands in everything, yeah. Yeah, I can tell you on the basis of all of false alarms we've had before. What really happens is as soon as you find a signal, everybody's you know on their Twitter account or their you know Facebook page or whatever, and in fact the media start calling you up right away. There, there's no, we have no obligation to tell the government anything. Anything, and in fact when we had a, a signal that did look real, this was quite a number of years ago. I kept waiting for the men in black to show up or the government to call up or yeah. the local mayor to shut us down. Something, uh, none of that happened. Nobody was interested except. Uh, my relatives, and uh, eventually the New York Times. Right. It would go a lot faster this day and age, I think. Uh, it might. It call, might. But, call but call me, me first is, yeah. is all I'm saying. Everybody tells me that. Call me first. <laughs> call me first. I'll, I'll call you first. Do you have a last name? Okay. <laughs> that would be great. Um, I call dibs on getting called second. Just okay. Out there. Okay. Um, Let's see if there's any more questions from the audience. Uh, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead, please. How many bottles of champagne do you guys have ready to go for yeah. when you? <laughs> yeah, that's that just become a sort of a famous thing. Uh, yeah. We always have a bottle of champagne. We, when we were observing down in Puerto Rico with the Arecibo telescope, you know, uh, we go down there and there was that bottle of champagne. I, I, I noticed that every time I went down, there was a different bottle of champagne. So <laughs> I, I think it's somebody who's celebrating prematurely, but, uh, up at the Allen Telescope Array, there may be a bottle of champagne in there, in the fridge there, but I haven't checked it lately. I haven't seen that for a long time. And by the way, when we had this signal that looked good for most of the day back in 1997, uh, I don't think anybody checked for the champagne. Actually, if, if something like that happens, champagne is not the first thing on your mind. <laughs> Have you had a chance to review the, that big telescope that's being built in China, the FAST telescope? Yeah, that's uh, that's something like uh, what three hundred. I don't know, it's a thousand feet. It's bigger, it, five hundred meters, I think, across five hundred meters. So twenty-five. Uh, you, you know, it's it's several times more sensitive than the telescope down in Puerto Rico than the Arecibo telescope. So it's bigger, bigger is better, and uh, will it be used to do SETI observations? I'm sure it will. The Chinese have some interest in that, so I'm sure it will be used. I've uh, got one last question that's going to come from Elad Avron. Uh, what percentage of your data is parsed by SETI at home and how vital is that to your operation? Well, for us, zero, because SETI at home is not our project. Uh, SETI at home is a project of the uh, University of California at Berkeley SETI team, and they are using it for processing some of their data. They have for, well, on the order of a decade, something like mm -hmm. that. And uh, millions of people have downloaded that screensaver, so it's been very popular. It, they, they only use it for a fraction of their data. They don't, you know, most of the data is reduced not using SETI at home. But, you know, the advantage of SETI at home is that it can intensively look at a, a lot of data, right? Because you have this enormous compute power at your disposal. And so uh, it's, I think it's a very interesting project. It's useful mostly in those experiments where you can't follow up right away and check out a signal. And that's why we actually, the, the idea was first floated to us, but it, the, the reason we didn't go in for that is simply that when we find a signal, you know, we follow up right away. Within minutes, we've, we've checked it out, okay, because we don't want any sort of drawers full of 
funny signals that nobody knows what they were, like the wow signal from the 1970s. So in order to do that, we follow up right away. In the case of SETI at home, you don't follow up right away. I mean, you know, you, you download some data for your screensaver maybe three weeks, three months after it was taken. So by then, you know, the telescope has long moved on. That's okay for their experiment because of the nature of what they're doing, but not for ours. Um, okay, so I think we need to wrap things up. I know you have a, a show that you've got to go, a radio show of your own that you got to go do. So, uh, can you let people know where they can find out more and, and follow your adventures? Absolutely. I mean, if you're interested in this, certainly go to SETI.org, uh, you know, on the web, SETI.org, as in organized, but maybe not. And, uh, our radio show is Big Picture Science, all one word, bigpicturescience.org. So I, I commend that to anybody. It's, it's, you know, it's a very wide-ranging show. I think this week's show is an interview I did with Adam Savage of Mythbusters. So. Oh, fantastic. I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> uh, so, and absolutely, if you just do a search for the SETI Institute, uh, you can find, I mean, you guys have great presence even, you know, on Instagram, on the the podcast that you do, your website is great, lots of great stories. So it's a it's a wonderful resource and uh, couldn't be a better group of people protecting us from that inevitable uh, first encounter with the aliens when they <laughs> blow up our, you know, important uh, points, of, points of interest. I don't think they have the budget to do that, but <laughs> no. maybe they have the incentive. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks a lot, Seth, for joining us on the Weekly Space Hangout. I know uh, all of the viewers really appreciated you joining us. And uh, maybe when you do find them, just uh, come on back on the show and we'll talk about them. <laughs> right. No, no. If we do find them, I think I'm going to hide in my, my den at home and shut the door. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Um, why don't we start with uh, Kimberly's story? So I'll let you organize that as you rearrange the screens. Uh, well, Ch while Chad rearranges the screens, uh, you can actually see it happening uh, in the in the little preview. Um, I wanted to do a few quick uh, points of interest here. One is a big, huge thank you to the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is the community that joins us who organizes the show. They really act as our producers for everything that we do here. So it's a great group of people. Uh, they started out on Google Plus. Now they're kind of everywhere. So I recommend you do a search for WSH crew and you can uh, join in that conversation. I'm also gonna shamelessly self promote myself for a second here as Chad continues to rearrange screens. Uh, and that is, uh, if you really enjoy the things that we're doing through Universe Today, uh, go, why don't you support our Patreon campaign? And that's a way that you can actually contribute funds. I bought uh, Wirecast, I bought screens, uh, we pay for serving, bandwidth, hosting, all that kind of stuff. So if you go to patreon.com slash universe today, there's lots of information on how you can support us and uh, some really cool rewards if you do so as well. So uh, thanks, are we rearranged? Talk to I want to talk to I want to talk to Kimberly, and get an update on Juno. Okay, give me three seconds. Oh, I know. Is it's there someone else I could talk to? It's just gonna take a second. Okay, all right, all right. You can actually. Uh, and then one, another reminder, this is a live show, so go ahead and post any comments and questions you like into the chat. And uh, if you use the little question mark icon, if you can dig up that little emoticon, then that will sort of be obvious to me, and then I will uh, be able to pass that question along to the person. All right, Kimberly, let's talk about Juno. Yes, let's talk about Juno. Uh, so Juno is NASA's mission to Jupiter. It has been en route to Jupiter for the past five years, and it is on its closest approach where it'll arrive at Jupiter uh, and July 4th. So it's on its way there. And just this morning, there was another significant milestone that Juno passed, where it has officially entered the uh, gravitational influence of Jupiter, as opposed to having the sun or the earth being the majority gravitational influence on the spacecraft. It is now officially within Jupiter's gravitational influence. So we are very rapidly counting down the days until Jupiter is making its final approach to Jupiter itself, where it will look at the layers underneath the clouds of Jupiter and measure things like the magnetosphere and the different storm activity and the auroras. And I've been looking forward to this mission for the past five years. So every time I get an update about Juno, uh, I sort of just want to geek out about it a little bit. But this is uh, one of the significant milestones that NASA has been looking forward to sort of as proof that Juno is on track for its 
uh, closest approach and July 4th. I'm Those amazed days. that people aren't freaking out about Juno. I mean, it's I've been, been so long. I've been freaking out since about we, Juno for years. <laughs> yeah, since we've had a nice close images from Jupiter. It was Galileo, which was sent into its demise like a decade ago. It's been a long time mm -hmm. since we've had, you know, the, the only snapshot that we had was a few images from New Horizons as it went past the system. Right, and that was and that's just what we've the, had. the very initial tests of New Horizons cameras and things like that. So we didn't really get any good measurements of Jupiter itself. Like you said, it's been a very long time since we've been there. And Juno is a very, very powerful spacecraft. It's about the size of a basketball court, and it has some of the largest solar panels that we've ever put on a spacecraft. Uh, I think I reported a few months ago that Juno passed the solar panel flyby distance record. Uh, so it's it's making history in a lot of ways. And uh, in particular, it's also going to get to look at a lot of the, uh, at, uh, the Galilean moons of Jupiter as well, which have always been of great interest to us. And it's going to be really helpful later on when NASA and ESA plan their missions to Europa. Yeah, so just, I mean two months away not even and we're all that's all right. we're gonna be talking about so you're you're beginning the drumbeat I'm, that will then I'm continue starting the juno countdown so that I, we get juno countdown and juno updates all the time like we had for new horizons i am very very excited for this yeah this is gonna be great um cool so is there any like science that's getting done right now right now no uh nasa's just getting updates from the spacecraft making sure that it's on track uh once it's making its final approach about a week or two out, then it'll start to turn on the systems and take some preliminary data to make sure that everything's working properly. But right now we're just concerned that it is on track and it hasn't moved off course at all. Yeah. Uh, that's super exciting. All right, let's move. We don't have a ton of time, so we're going to, we're going to be going fast here. Uh, let's go to uh, Paul and talk about some fresh lunar craters. I'm ready. Okay, we'll do it fast. Uh, so there is an instrument on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter called LAMP, which uses ultraviolet light from distant stars to look inside of like the shadows of craters, uh, places on the moon that never get any sunlight. And it kind of, uh, it can actually see in the dark to see what's going on. And recently the LAMP team announced that they discovered some quote unquote fresh craters on the moon these craters are like 15 million 16 million years old which in so fresh that is like that's yesterday yeah. i mean come on that's a blink of an eye yeah to a uh, cosmologist so the, uh, yeah i know well what other time scale is relevant fraser yeah. i challenge okay uh and that's cool because uh we're learning through studying craters on the moon the ages of the craters the distributions the sizes it's almost like a, a record of the formation and the history of the solar system. And by studying the craters and especially by identifying some new craters on the moon, we're studying like how the solar system cleaned itself out after it first formed and since then. Right. So, I mean, is that like the newest craters, like newest significant craters on the moon are these? I think it is actually. And if one of these were to hit the earth, what would happen? It would suck. That's your, that's your technical professional opinion. I've put that it would word suck bad a, a, yeah. a very bad day. Yeah. There have been some super recent ones. I, I don't have a story off the top of my head, but also from um, LRO, like between mapping new craters, but I think they were super tiny. Yeah, there's always the little tiny ones, uh, yeah. always hitting the Earth, always hitting uh, the Moon. Uh, but these are ones are pretty significant. Yeah. Um, cool. That's awesome. Uh, let's let's go to Dr. Brian Koberlein next, and we're going to talk about primordial black holes solving solving dark matter. That okay. Was helpful. All right, Brian, what uh, solve it? <laughs> well, it probably doesn't solve it. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, there's. Uh, we think of a black hole as a collapsed star or a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. But a primordial black hole would be one that formed uh, in the early moments of the universe, like in the first millisecond of the universe, uh, from little fluctuations of energy or matter, and then you know, stayed that way. And the type of size that you might have is anything from you know, really, really tiny, the size of a mountain, a massive mountain, up to maybe 30, 35 solar masses. So there was a recent article out 
that looked at the results from LIGO. And one of the interesting things about LIGO is the order of the mass for the two colliding black holes that generated the gravitational waves was about 30 solar masses, which is odd in terms of its size. And so this paper proposed that, well, maybe these weren't some remnant of a collapsed super large star, but they were primordial black holes. And, and if you then carry that further and say that, well, then how many primordial black holes would you have to have? Could that in fact solve dark matter? And the paper argues that it can. Other people have argued that it can't. Um, one of the big problems is that in order to make up dark matter, you'd have to have a whole bunch of these primordial black holes and they would have some observational effect. You would see lensing, gravitational lensing from stars if they passed in front of a star. If you see gamma ray bursts, some of them should interact with dark matter black holes. And so you would see some type of micro lensing from that. And we haven't seen any of that. So the observational limits on primordial black holes are actually fairly strong, but of the basic idea is that, well, maybe if you just shoehorn it in in just the right way with just the right size, it could explain dark matter. So it's an interesting idea, but I would still say it's probably long odds. But my, if I just, uh, favorite, uh, if I can, I have a joke. Go ahead, Paul. My favorite uh, response to this paper was from Mike Turner at the University of Chicago. He said, uh, of course it could be right, but if the paper is correct, I'll eat it. <laughs> Well, I, I had a chance to interview uh, Ned Wright, and that was uh, the theory that he liked the best, although he thought it was totally not true. So he he enjoyed it mostly for its ability to troll other physicists, not because he necessarily thought it was the most likely outcome for uh, for what for what is the cause of dark matter. He just thought it was a, it was a hilarious argument because it's really hard to kind of poke holes in it, but at the same time, it's super weird to do. Um, but I, I guess, you know, if I understand my primordial black holes, uh, you know, these are these, that there's no mechanism that can form them today in the universe. You can only right. get the supermassive and the stellar mass black holes that instead they come with the folds and over densities in the early universe as it was expanding after the Big Bang. And that one of the things with these primordial black holes is that they're going to evaporate. So shouldn't there be some kind of, of energy, some kind of particles, some kind of, you know, primordial black hole cosmic background radiation going on? Right. If, if they were small, you would expect that Hawking radiation would cause them to radiate away and we should see some signature of them uh, when they, you know, completely evaporate. But, and that's where actually most of the research on primordial black holes originally focused was on these really small black holes, things that would be too small to form from stars or in the centers of galaxies. And so as time has gone on, we haven't found the Hawking radiation flashes. Uh, people have proposed, well, maybe you could get bigger black holes, so kind of stellar mass type black holes that were formed in the early universe. And that's what these specific ones are talking about. So you wouldn't see the Hawking radiation from them because they're too big, uh, but you should expect to see some type of gravitational lensing. So, you know, the, the interesting thing about this paper is it tends to kind of push the far end of any observational constraint in order to kind of shoehorn it in as, as an idea. So, so it, it's basically, if you fudge the data just right, you can kind of fit into that tiny little hole and say, and success, um, right. but the odds are not very high. So all the little ones will have evaporated away and you'll be left with this exact size that hasn't evaporated away yet. That right, I mean, primordial black holes are interesting in general, just because you would expect some fluctuations might cause black holes in the early universe. That's not an unreasonable idea per se. Uh, but observationally, we found just absolutely no evidence for them. So either, you know, they didn't form or they're somehow hiding, irregardless of whether or not they can account for black uh, dark matter. Isn't it a little unnerving to think that 26% of the universe or whatever it is, is, is these black holes and that they are a huge halo around every galaxy? And like, that's just a little, that's a little scary that it's all no, black I holes. I, you know, the moon is flying overhead every now and then. I don't freak out. <laughs> well, maybe so. you should. Maybe I should. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, cool. All right. Well, let's move on. Uh, Jolene, let's talk about a uh, spacecraft launch. Cool. So 
Uh, India is attempting to get into the reusable spacecraft industry, which, as we know, Blue Origins and SpaceX has been all about recently, because building rockets, as it turns out, is super, super expensive. So if you can shoot a rocket up and then have it land and not, say, implode on impact or burn apart in the atmosphere, that would be ideal, because it's a lot cheaper to just reuse a spacecraft than to uh, make a new rocket. So this past week, India launched some tiny rockets uh, well, one tiny rocket into uh, the air. It went up about 70 kilometers or 43 miles, and it came back down in the Bay of Bengal and landed safely. Uh, notably, it was only seven meters in size, about 21 feet, which is a little too small for humans or any type of cargo to really fit in. Uh, so this was just a prototype. It was a test for technology that they plan on scaling up to hopefully use as sort of like viable rockets to get things to space um, and do various launches. Apologize. Uh, we're trying to bring up the video here and it's clearly destroyed everything. Cause, uh, cause well, I can talk a little bit more. People can, can look at me. Right? Well, yeah, exactly. They can look at the little version of you right there. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's been, uh, they've been wildly successful so far, uh, India has, in a lot of their various ventures. Uh, they had their Mars orbiter mission, which uh, they put around, uh, put in orbit around Mars in 2015, uh, took a whole bunch of different images, and notably they did so for about $72 million. And for comparison, the Mavin orbiter, which was sent to orbit Mars, costs 10 times that amount. So uh, India has done a number of different space things for things that are really cost effective. Um, so hopefully they continue on that path and we have a whole bunch of governments and private organizations making reusable spacecrafts. So viable space industry, here we come. Uh, now she's just a weird, sorry, apologize. Uh, you've now become weird symbols on my screen. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're, now you're back. Could you hear me or was I just- Yeah, we can hear you just was, fine. Okay. So, and we can see the little version of you, but for some reason the big version of you got totally corrupted. We tried to show the launch video, but there's like some kind of future copyright protection now, yeah. future copyright yeah. takedown requests that, that they even detect us trying to queue up that video on, on my computer and they, they send me the oh. copyright takedown. No, so before we started though, see, I knew this was gonna come in handy. I drew an image of a rocket. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so yeah. we can pew, pew. All right, I simulated the, sound the launch effects. for us. Yeah. Super yeah. realistic, Jolene, thank I, you. So glad I did that because it sounds. <laughs> it was sounds, yeah. That's it's awesome. like we were there. That we, it really that's, is. It feels like we were there. The that would explain why they can do it so cheaply. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is a very accurate. Chad, you're just you're gonna break it. Uh, okay, I'm glad that happened just now. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, cool. Uh, let me see if I got any questions for you. Otherwise, we will move on. Um, oh. This is this comes from the uh, from the audience, which was uh, any news on the in on the inhabit the uh, the habitat the inflatable habitat. Have you been following the beam inflation? Uh, I have. But the last I heard about it was a while ago, so I haven't uh, heard any developments or yeah. anything like that as of late. So I can't answer that now. Yeah, I heard it. It didn't work well. No, no, that's too bad. Um, all right, well let's move on. Uh, can we talk to Nicole? Yes, you can. Sorry, I'm reading the comments. <laughs> I yeah. love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> poor Chad. Oh, poor Chad. Uh, what? Um, the, the, yeah, the, the, uh, apparently, I'm. They've all decided to agree not to assign me to the decryption of the alien signals. Yeah, that might be best. I'll take it. Good. I'll take it the wrong way. Uh, go ahead. Let's talk about Meerkat. Sure. So um, Meerkat is a radio telescope. Surprise! I'm talking about radio astronomy. Um, in South Africa, actually, uh, the site uh, in the Karoo, where I spent a couple of weeks when I was a grad student. Um, so uh, this is one of the Pathfinder projects for the Square Kilometer Array, which is this huge, massive uh, radio telescope that's being planned for the next couple of decades. Um, but Meerkat uh, is coming online, and yes, it is named adorably after the little Meerkat animal, uh, although Karoo Array Telescope gives you the K-A-T, and as I understand it, the first one was called, the first telescope was called CAT, and they added Meerkat, which is more 
cat and also the name of the tiny animal. Something like that. Something adorable. Anyway, they did um, their first image. They're not very specifically not calling it their first light image. It's just a test image. Um, but if I don't know if we'll get a chance to show it um, to uh, the untrained eye, it looks like a bunch of dots. Um, but for uh, an radio astronomy, this is very interesting. It's one degree by one degree, which is a fairly sizable um, piece of the sky, as uh, Seth Shostak was talking about earlier. Uh, one degree for scale, if you put your finger at the, I can't fit that all in the frame. If you put your finger at arm's length, um, your index finger covers about a degree of the sky. So to give you an idea of so how big, oh, there's the image. full moons in the sky. Yes, exactly four full moons, um, and they've uh, circled a bunch of known sources, uh, things that were picked up by the predecessor telescope, um, CAT-7, which was running when I was there, um, as well as another array from an Australian telescope, um, and then they've seen a couple of sources that weren't detected in these. There's not a lot, if I remember from my time working on this, there's not a whole lot of high fidelity maps of the radio sky in the southern hemisphere the way there are in the northern hemisphere um so this is really uh, uh very exciting that these more sensitive telescopes um are coming online in the southern hemisphere now if you uh remember from us talking about this probably a bunch of times before or if you've heard about this otherwise the ska square kilometer array is being built in two sites um splitting by frequency sort of um one will be in this uh section of south africa another one will be in australia um, so that's a new, first new test image um, coming from Meerkat, which is an adorable name for a telescope. And so we're going to see this a lot, right? We're going to see this very powerful array, and now they're going to, there's new instruments being developed, and they're going to be attaching them to yep. the array, like a Swiss Army well, this, knife. This, yeah, this, this, this is using only four of the planned 64 dishes that will be in the array. So this isn't super sensitive. Um, it's, uh, you once you get four, you can... Uh, solve for various quantities when you're you're making this image and four is kind of the good number you want to start with um, But it's nowhere near the sensitivity that it, it uh, will be getting to uh, later on Fantastic. All right, let's move on uh, let's Go back around. Uh, let's talk to Kimberly and talk about uh, Earth's ocean Europa's oceans Europa's oceans. Yes so the one sentence summary of this story is that astronomers at NASA have modeled the subsurface ocean on Europa and have found that it may have this a uh, very similar chemical balance uh, to the chemical balance that we see in Earth's oceans, which may be able to support bacterial life under the surface. Now, why this is very important is because uh, Europa's oceans, unlike Earth's oceans, are subsurface, which means that they do not receive any sunlight. And so any life that happens in the ocean must get its energy from somewhere other than sunlight. And the only process available to it is a thing called chemosynthesis as opposed to photosynthesis, where it's taking its energy from uh, the chemicals in the oceans through chemical reactions. And in order to have the chemical reactions that you need in order to get the energy to support that bacterial life, you need to have a very particular balance between the amount of oxygen and the amount of hydrogen that you have in the available ocean. Now on Earth, uh, this chemical balance between oxygen and hydrogen happens when the ocean interacts with our atmosphere, where it gets its oxygen from, and also where the ocean interacts with the seafloor, where it gets its hydrogen from the hydrothermal vents from volcanism. But neither of these processes are available in Europa's ocean because uh, Europa Europa's ocean doesn't have direct contact with the very thin atmosphere because there's a layer of ice in the way. And there's also no volcanic processes on the uh, seafloor in Europa. At least we don't think there are. And if there aren't, there may also be a layer of ice at the bottom, which prevents contact between the ocean and the seafloor. So they needed to find ways, uh, plausible ways to uh, get oxygen into the ocean and also get hydrogen into the ocean. And what they've done is the uh, the oxygen they have found actually is very plausibly, it comes from when Jupiter's radiation strikes the ice uh, on the surface of Europa and sort of breaks apart all of the water ice molecules. And then some of that oxygen trickles down into the ocean underneath. And then from the seafloor up, there's actually chemical reactions that happen between the uh, the ocean 
and the rock or with a, an ice barrier sort of as the intermediary uh, through a process called serpentinization where the ocean and the rock have their own chemical reaction that releases hydrogen into the ocean afterwards. And what they found is when they balance all these processes together, they come up with a very similar oxygen to hydrogen ratio, uh, very similar to what we see on Earth. And as we know on Earth, the ocean is teeming full of life. And a lot of which, when you get low enough, uh, is supported through the similar chemosynthesis process, like we would expect something on Europa to do. It's so this most recent model of the ocean is actually very favorable towards supporting bacteria. It's super amazing to me that that they've been able to make these kinds of observations uh, and f on, from Europa, you know, are, are they Earth-based observations? Are they using stuff from Galileo and the Voyager spacecraft? Boy, wouldn't it be great if there was a spacecraft on its way to Jupiter and its moons right now? Really great if, you know, we had a spacecraft on our way to the Jupiter system, you know, in about a month and a half or so. Yeah. Uh, but most of the observations that we have are Earth-based, uh, where we can actually observe the chemical reactions taking place between, uh, like, on the surface of Europa on the ice layer, uh, as Jupiter is bombarding it with radiation, we can we can observe those reactions from Earth, and the the subterranean uh, reactions I was talking about, the serpentinization that happens at the ocean floor, those are still theoretical because obviously we haven't drilled down to see what it's like under there yet, yeah. but we have good ideas of the depth of the ocean, uh, and sort of the the layers of ice and ocean and rock. We have good ideas approximately about how thick they are and whether they may be in contact with each other. And if it works anything at all, like having ocean and rock on earth interact with each other, then we'll get this type of chemical reaction to release the hydrogen. Right. So somewhat theoretical, somewhat observation based, but supported by just about everything we see on earth as well. And just like a whole other reason for us to send the Europa mission specifically oh. to make those observations directly. So, right. This yeah. is a, a very great support for the future missions to Europa where they actually want to drill down under the ice and access that ocean. This is a, a good piece of evidence to support yeah. funding those missions. Um, okay, let's move on. We've got probably the time for like one, we've got two more stories. So uh, Paul, let's talk about the famous early, early galaxy. Yeah, again? so there's this, uh, yeah, again. No, no, this is just different, all right? Just deal with it. Um, there's this phase in the universe where it goes from being neutral to an ionized gas. It became neutral uh, very early on, the creation of the cosmic microwave background when atoms first coalesced and let go of that light that we now see in the microwaves. The universe was neutral. But nowadays, we see an ionized universe. Almost all the gas we see in the universe is ionized. So the question is, how did it go from neutral to ionized? And we actually don't have any direct observations yet of this very important epoch uh, very early in our universe's history. And we're starting very slowly to pick up some clues. And this latest result is one of those clues where we've identified a very young galaxy, so a very, or sorry, a very old galaxy um, in the early universe that is actually very small. That's really cool. Uh, and I would love, I've got a million questions, but I think we're going to have to just move on to the, to the last, uh, to the last story. And this comes from uh, Jolene about uh, Australia getting smashed by an asteroid. Yes, a huge asteroid smashed into Australia. It was about 30 kilometers or 18 miles wide. And to give you some idea about how big that is. The Hang one on a sec. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Uh, we're getting a no audio comments in the feed. Oh, so while the pictures are there? Uh, can everyone hear me now? Yes? No? Yeah, I'm There's a bit of a delay. 
Yeah. Go for it. Okay. Uh, so an asteroid smashed into Australia, again, about 30 kilometers wide or 18 miles, just in case people didn't hear me when I said it the first time. And to give you some comparison about how big that is, it's two to three times larger than the one that is thought to have contributed to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Fortunately, it happened about 13.5 billion years ago. It didn't happen last week or anything, because if it did, we'd all be very, very, very much dead. Uh, ultimately, uh, sent, it sent up enough material to basically uh, cover the planet. Um, sort of goes without saying, since it was larger than the one that impacted the dinosaurs. Uh, and the scientists discovered evidence of this uh, using drilling cores from some of the oldest sediment found on Earth. And what they found was glass beads between two layers of volcanic sediment. And that is how they determined that this impact happened. But since it was so long ago, basically all geological evidence uh, has been eroded. It's gone. So it's not like we see this huge, huge circle crater site or anything like that, which is uh, what we see looking at the uh, Gulf of Mexico, where the impact was, which uh, helped kill the dinosaurs. So yeah, really big impact. But, but I'm trying to sort of compare it, right? Like the 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 one that killed the dinosaurs was about 10 kilometers across, and this one, oh sorry, 10 miles across, 16 kilometers. 15. So this is a lot bigger than the yeah. than the dinosaur yes. one. Yeah. Yeah. So this this uh, asteroid is about two to three times larger. So the devastation would have been a lot, lot, lot larger as well. Uh, but it happened again 3.5 billion years ago. The one that killed the dinosaurs about 66 million years ago. Um, so 3.5 billion years ago, there wasn't really a lot of life around at that time so as far as the impact on life and stuff it was have been a lot less if it hit today though we would be yeah, very much wiped out wow uh yeah I, some you know if something that size hit today we would have chunks of uh rock going around the whole world all the forest would light on fire it would be just a horrible horrible time um i've still got a picture up here chad there. Sorry. Um, cool. Well, we should wrap things up. Uh, sorry to everyone. When we had a picture up for uh, Paul, we lost his audio. Uh, again, still, this technology is very complicated, and we will continue to figure it out. But as you see, we've got the improvement this way. We've got the little screens, because last time everyone was like, oh, it's really sad. We didn't see all the people, and we weren't really sure that they were even there. Uh, but they are there. And so thanks again. And I will say this again, and I'll just keep saying this. Please give us any feedback that you have on how we can make this show better. We're trying to, uh, you know, we're putting up pictures and sometimes destroying the audio, uh, putting up the linset images. So it's, uh, and we've got the little grid. So once again, if you can give us any suggestions as a viewer, uh, we love it. Uh, just send me an email. Uh, FraserCane at gmail.com is probably the easiest way to get directly to me. And then I will uh, nag chat and we will figure it out. So let's go around and give everyone a chance to uh, let people know where we can find more. Uh, Kimberly, where do we find out more about you? People can find out more about me by following me on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier and by checking out my website, KimberlyCartier.org. Fantastic. Uh, Jolene. Uh, you can find me at Futurism.com, Futurism on Facebook and Twitter and Google Plus and basically all the social media sites that are currently in existence. All hail Futurism. You guys are just killing it. You get such a great site. I'm... Uh, I'm now see you as like a fearsome competitor, but a, oh, also a good no. friend. Also no. a good friend, but also a fearsome competitor. <laughs> so uh, congratulations. You guys are doing a wonderful job of, of space reporting and building a, a great site. So keep it up. Uh, I'm sure know. Jolene would hire you. And let me, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I might be looking for, no, I'm not looking for If you want to, I'll take you under my wing, Fraser. That's oh, that would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, just like Seth Shaw stack before. Um, all right, let's move on. Nicole, where do people find out more? Hi, I'm Noisy Astronomer. I don't post super whole lot lately. Uh, I've been focusing on teaching, but I will figure out what fun things I'm doing this summer in the interim. So check me out there. Noisy Astronomer. The fans are really glad that you made it back to the show. <laughs> I miss you guys. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I love my students, but I do miss you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, so that's the trick is people just need to go to your college and sign up for your class and then they can hang out with you in person. See me every day. You'd be sick of me. <laughs> Paul Matt Sutter, where do people find out more? At Paul Matt Sutter. Right on. Um, how how is the interpretive astronomy dance going? 
Oh, so it was a huge success. Uh, two weeks ago, like we had a premiere, uh, live premiere a month ago. Two weeks ago, we filmed it with 360 degree cameras. Uh, so uh, the film of the premiere and the 360 degree of virtual reality planetarium film are all in post-production right now. Fantastic. Well, you can I, find out more at songofthestars.org. Wonderful. I'm really glad I was able to participate in making this a success and I'm sure everybody else who did, that's, uh, that's great. We need it's more great. astronomy interpretive dance. Totally. Dancing with the stars. I'm sure someone's made that joke. Yeah, that name was taken. Oh. Do, do, you, do you need yeah. a belly dancer? I'm out no. of practice, but oh, okay. <laughs> no, because they already got me. I can tap dance. Oh, tap. And Brian this Coberline. It's supposed to be astronomers oh. doing dance badly. It's supposed <laughs> to be actually good professional dancers uh, talking oh, about. Sick burn. I was semi professional. Come on. <laughs> Brian Coberline. Was, was. Yeah, Where do we dance. find out more? That, and you do not dance. I do not dance. Yeah. So, um, you can find me at briancoberline.com or Twitter at Brian Coberline or Google Plus or whatever. My name is unusual enough that you can find me pretty easily. Or search for one universe at a time. Or search for yeah. one universe at a time. Or just read my Twitter feed because we constantly tweet out links <laughs> to your stories because they're so good. So, well, um, thank you. And uh, weren't you going to be doing video at some point in addition to yeah, your podcast? Yeah, it's coming. I've got, I've got the equipment. I just haven't done it. So this well, summer is going to well, be Well, I think we're going to do a collaboration. Uh, Paul and I are going to have got a collaboration in the works. We're probably going to shoot in the next couple of days all about virtual particles. But, but I would really like your help uh, explaining time dilation. So if okay. you're not ready to do your own video feed, then I will drag you. Uh, onto the YouTubes and we'll make it happen. So uh, okay, so stay that sounds tuned like a plan. Everyone. That'd be great because I'm gonna wreck time dilation if I do it on my own. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it takes time, but it's all relative. Uh, cool. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today for the weekly space hangout. Big thanks to the fans and everyone in the chat. Uh, you were busy. I could see what was happening, and it was uh, very entertaining. So uh, please uh, continue. Keep the conversation going. Hopefully next week or um, or the next couple of weeks, or maybe after the break. Anyway, we're going to try and figure out how to bring that chat into the show. But that's a whole other level of technology that we still have to figure out. Um, cool. Well, I will. Uh, I think we can wrap this up. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel on YouTube, whichever channel you're watching it on and that way you'll get a notification next time we go live which uh hopefully will be next week although i might be on an airplane so i might so i might we might not have a show next week which is of course news to everyone in the wsh crew but i just uh, got this confirmation so anyway i will uh we'll keep you posted uh thanks again for everyone and we'll see you all next week bye bye, bye. bye. complete the event